Easter Sunday. It's on a Sunday like this that, you know, you generally tend to hear a sermon that speaks of Jesus uh, who rose from the grave. And that's very true and very valid and very necessary. In fact, we're going to hear a, a similar sermon. But, 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 but this Sunday, I really want us to posture our hearts in, in, in a way that, uh, that we're actually going to listen. Because I think for many of us, what we do is we go, oh, I've heard this before. I know how the story ends, which is beautiful. It's beautiful that we know how the story ends. Uh, but then what we do is instead of being in awe, we then normalize. And, and the danger of normalizing is that then this just becomes, oh, here we go again, instead of, oh, my goodness, tell us more about him. Sure. And so that's my hope, that, 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 that we would posture our hearts in that way. Because a friend of mine, uh, Joby Martin, says this, if the tomb is empty, then anything is possible. If the tomb is empty, then anything is possible. And I don't know what you are hoping that God would make possible. But what I do know is that the tomb is empty. And so that is the heart that I want us to come to this text with. And so if you have a Bible, you can meet me in Ephesians chapter 2. That's where we're going to be in the first 10 verses. Ephesians chapter 2. Let me read it to us, then I'll pray, and then we'll get to work. Hear these words of our Father. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the year, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts, and we were by nature children under wrath as the others were also. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. You are saved by grace. He also raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavens in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For you are saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is... God's gift, not from works, so that no one can boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that uh, these words may be old. They're ancient, but they're not dead. They are very much alive. And so God, I pray that these words would take a hold of our hearts, that they would point us to you, And that we would see you for who you are as our risen king. Lord, I pray for every single person in here this morning. I pray that Holy Spirit, you are at work because you are meeting them where they are. Transform them. Those who need healing, would you bring it? Those who need reconciliation or restoration, would you bring it? And those who need to be saved, God, would you save? I pray against the evil one whose desires are to steal, kill, and destroy. But you, Jesus, as the good shepherd, you come and bring life and you bring it to the full. It's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. May the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. God, you are our king. You are our redeemer. Would you have your way in this place? In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, Ephesians chapter 2 is considered by many to to be the clearest, the most expressive description of what it means to be saved, what we in the church call salvation. Paul, the apostle, the author of this book, he begins chapter 2 in explaining salvation by stating what kind of people we were before God initiated his grand rescue plan. Let me read it to you again. It says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in disobedience. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and thoughts. And we were by nature children under the wrath as others were also. Paul's purpose here is, is not to throw judgment That's not what he's doing. His desire is to show us the spiritual condition of everyone when separated from God. Uh, Permit me to take it one step further. 
He wants to show us that God's rescue plan for you begins with a recognition of our complete sinfulness. That's what he's trying to do. He's, he's going, I need you to see this. But what is sin? What is sin? We, we hear it all the time. If you've been coming to church for a while, you hear it all the time. But, but what is it? Do you really understand what it means? Paul here uses two words, which together can summarize the Bible's teaching on sin. Paul says we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Uh, the first of these terms, trespasses, indicates deviating from the right course or crossing a boundary or breaking a command. Th this expresses our rebellion against God's rule. God has said you shall not, but we have. God says you shall, but we have not. All of us are guilty of trespasses, for we have not kept God's law. The, the second word, uh, translated here simply as sins, means to fall short of the mark. It, it is used of a, a, an arrow that lands short of its target. Yeah. And hear this, close is still not bullseye. Yeah. And so that's what many of us do. We say, but, but I got so close. Yeah. But you didn't hit the bullseye. Yeah. Sure. It means failing to meet the required standard. In this case, God's perfect standard of holiness. That's the call. God calls us to be, to be perfect. That's the standard. Not, not whatever you can achieve. That's where you put the standard and you go, you know, because I know that there's a, a bunch of people that can't meet that. So now you walk around communicating, that's God's standard. No, it's not. He's his perfection of which all of us fail. In Romans chapter 3, verse 23, Paul says this. For all have sinned. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have to recognize our sin and how we fall short and how we are in desperate need of a savior. We are not the people that God intended us to be. Let me just, let me just make it plain. We are not the people that God intended us to be. Our sin has wrecked the original plan. That's right. That's right. Let me give you a few things that sin has done. Like how bad is sin? Like what has sin done? Let, let me give you a few. Number one, sin causes death. We were created for eternity, friends. Sin shortcut that reality. When Jesus heard that Lazarus, his very good friend, had died, he goes to his home in Bethany, where Lazarus' sisters Mary and Martha are. Four days, four days after Lazarus' death. And, and that's a whole other sermon that I could preach. Like, he, he hears that, like, yo, your friend Lazarus, is, he's not doing well. He could have gone in that moment, but he waits. It's now four days after Lazarus' death. Let me read it to you, John 11, verse 31 to 33. Let me tell you what happens here. As soon as Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and told him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. There is something, something that Mary recognizes in Jesus that goes, you know what? When I'm with you, there's something about you that goes, we weren't meant to die. That's good. Sure. That's good. Sure, that's awesome. And so if you had been here, yeah. verse 33, when Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Yeah. The phrase deeply moved in the Greek points to, to a, a, a more anger posture than compassion. The Greek word for compassion is splach nizome. No, no, that's not what this word is. This is, this is more anger. Jesus, hear me, he was definitely sad. Yeah. Yeah. We see that in verse 35 where we're told that he wept. 
but he's also upset. He's angry. Why? And at who? Well, let's start with the who. He's angry at death. Why? Because we were made to live forever. He's, he's angry at death. How dare you? They were created to live forever. Friends, we know that some people live until 90. You might know some people who've lived until 90, who are still alive even today, maybe beyond 90. Some live over 100 years. Noah, in the Bible, we're told, lived for 930 years. Can, can, like, I, would, I don't even know what to do with 400 years. 930 years. That is a lot. And yet the heavens look and they go, it's too short. Sure. His life got cut too short. 930, I mean, all of us, we'd go, yo, we marvel at 100 years. And the heavens go, it's too short. Sin cuts our lives short. Let me tell you another thing about sin. Sin reduces us to cravings. Sin reduces us to cravings. We see this in verses 1 to 3 in Paul's opening statement. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you previously walked according to the ways of this world, according to the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit now working in the disobedient. We too all previously lived among them in our fleshly desires, carrying out the inclinations of our flesh and our thoughts and we were by nature children under the wrath as others were also. It reduces us to cravings. And this, this, what I've just read to you, this is the description of our culture. Let's be honest. Yeah. 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 Our lifestyles are driven by our cravings. J- James says this. <laughs> Chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. He says, what is the source of wars and fights among you? Don't they come from your passions that wage war within you? What he's saying is that what you see on the outside started on the inside. It started with that craving, that lust. You desire and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. Again, another prayer, prayer sermon series right there. You ask and don't receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your what? Pleasures. Sin reduces us to cravings. I do what I want, when I want, with whomever I want. Like, that's, that's the culture today. I do what I want, when I want, with whomever I want. And... As the church, as, as those who've crossed the line of faith, as the children of God, like we look to culture, and, and I get it, I get it. It's, it's disturbing, it's wrong, because like that's not how we were uh, created to live and to be. But, but sometimes I go, man, the, the level of shock that we have, like what do you expect? Or, or maybe you've forgotten who you were before Jesus showed up into your life. That, that might be because you've normalized this. This has become every... So now you're just like, oh, how, how could they? You, you know when it should be shocking for us? It's when this happens in the church. When the church says, I do what I want, when I want, with whomever I want. And then we bend God's word. Like we, we bend it so that, it, so that it, it can mean what we want it to mean. You know, if you just read it, you'll go, that's actually not what it says. So firstly, it tells us that we are not reading the scriptures. Yeah. Yeah. We're not taking time to understand what it is that God wants for us. Sin reduces us to our cravings. And, and cravings aren't great. 
They're revealing. They're revealing. They're revealing that, one, you haven't eaten. You know when I crave stuff? It's when I haven't had, like, breakfast or lunch or, like, I haven't had a healthy meal. And so all of a sudden, I'm like, you know, you know what would be really, really good for me? Like, if I ate a whole chocolate cake, the Willie's one. You know the Willie's one? Like, that thing, I'm t- and I could. I could. You know how, like, when you, you like, you'll eat. You know, and, you, like, you're putting it back, but you're, like, you're still, like, it's, a, it's, a cr- it's revealing that I, that I haven't yeah. eaten properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so Friends, when... When we are driven by our cravings, it reveals that, that, that you haven't been eating. Because there is an appetite in us. There is one. There is an appetite in us. We have been designed to worship God, to be filled by him. And so when we don't do that, we go to other places. And sin loves that. It loves that. It'll tell you, no, no, you, what you actually, you don't need Jesus. What you need is a relationship. That's what will fill you. Well, you know what you need? You need a promotion at work. You don't need Jesus. If you had that promotion, your life would be so much better. And then you show up on Sunday and you're like, there is nothing. <laughs> sin, sin will fool us. The thief comes only. And we've got to recognize that that what you crave is different to what you crave. And so so let's let's just be careful, even with one another. Let's let's be careful. Third thing. Sin leads to an eternal death. This is more than the physical. Physical. Sin leads to an eternal death because of a separation from God. This is more than the body. This is the soul. Verse 1 starts by saying, and you were dead. Dead. To, To be dead in sin is to ultimately suffer eternal death. To be separated from God forever. The first three verses in Ephesians chapter 2 are often referred to as the death valley. And Paul's description puts us right at the bottom of it, with no escape, or so it seems. These three verses function as a three-verse summary of the first three chapters of the book of Romans, another letter that Paul wrote. And in those three chapters, Paul teaches on the total depravity of mankind. Now, now this is a phrase that many of us, we don't like to use because it makes people feel uncomfortable. And it should. Friends, it, it, it should make people feel uncomfortable. So, 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 so it's okay if, if you're talking about these things and you, and you realize like, well, people are, people are starting to feel uncomfortable. It's because deep down inside, they are crying out for something. Yeah. Yeah. They don't know what it is, but they know, they know. It's like, I was made for more. Mm-hmm. And so what is our job is to go, I'd like to tell you who that more is. His name is Jesus. Yeah. He doesn't want to leave you at the bottom of this death valley. The the biblical doctrine of depravity means that every part of the human person is contaminated, infected, polluted, and stained by sin. Every single part. All of us are depraved and totally so. And because of this, apart from Christ, we are totally lost. Our depravity is so great that near the end of his argument in Romans chapter 3, Paul says this, as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. Now, I know we often hear people say, such and such a person is seeking after God. Right? We, We hear that. Indeed, it may be true that he or she is seeking the peace or the hope that salvation brings. 
But if we are to believe God's word and not our emotions, we would see that it is the Holy Spirit who is prompting them. It's the Holy Spirit who's working because left to our own, we would never choose God. We, We just wouldn't. And so it's a prompting of the Holy Spirit who's going, you've got a giant hole in your soul that needs to be filled. I, I want to lead you to the one who can. Yeah. But remember, the enemy is doing everything that he can to pull you away from it. Yeah. <coughs> the biblical doctrine of depravity demands an acceptance of man's absolute spiritual death. And that's what Paul's doing in the opening verses of chapter 2 in Ephesians. He's just going, I need you to recognize who you are without Jesus. Every soul outside of Christ is in the death valley. The the prophet Ezekiel wrote this in Ezekiel chapter 37, 1 to 3. He says, "The, the Lord took hold of me and I was carried away by the spirit of the Lord to a valley filled with bones. He led me all around among the bones that covered the valley floor. They were scattered everywhere across the ground and were completely dried out. Then he asked me, son of man, can these bones become living people again? Oh, sovereign Lord, I replied, you alone know the answer to that. And God does answer. He does answer in verse 5, 4 and 5 of Ephesians chapter 2. God tears through the cosmic brokenness and reaches into the depth of the death valley. But God. With those two words, we see God stretching out his hand of grace. But God. Who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. Paul tells us that God is rich in mercy. He's rich in mercy. What what does that mean? It means that there there is nothing that you can do or that's been done to you that will separate you from God. You cannot outrun the grace of God. There is more grace in Jesus than sin in you. Because he is rich in he has enough. Right? And we'll tell ourselves, like, no, but you have no idea what I've done. No, I have enough. The the debt, the debt that lies behind me because of the things that I've I have enough. Rich in mercy. What is mercy? It's compassion or forgiveness shown to one's enemy or to someone who has wronged you. And we, before Jesus, have wronged God. And we are his enemy. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love that he had for us, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in trespasses. God is both the initiator and the power to make us alive. He is both the initiator and the power to make us alive. Amen. Not us. Why, Arne? Remember, we're dead people. Yeah. What, 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 what can dead people do? Sorry. What can dead people do? There we go. Absolutely nothing. Let's go back to the story of Lazarus. After crying for his dead friend, verse 38 of chapter 11 says, then Jesus deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a a cave and a stone was lying against it. Remove the stone, Jesus said. Remove the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, told him, Lord, there's already a stench because he has been dead four days. That, like, like, that's proper dead. When people are going, like, think about this for a moment. It's like, no, 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 I know Jesus. And I've said to him, had you been here? And I know how powerful he is. I know what he's able to do. But you know what, Jesus, I, this is dead, dead. 
Like maybe if you showed up and you're sick, maybe even one day, Jesus, you could have done something. But this is now four days, dead, dead. Like, what are you hoping for? He's so, there's a smell. It's so bad. Like, it's like, just, just forget it. Jesus said to her, didn't I tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? What do you need to believe today? What stone is in front of you? And you're just, you're just going, you know what? I, I'm not even going to ask. Because it's dead, dead. My situation is dead, dead. My marriage is dead, dead. My, my prodigal son or prodigal daughter, dead, dead. No, no. What stone is in front of you? Rich in mercy. So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd standing here, I said this so that they may believe you sent me. After he said this, he shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Charles Spurgeon says this. He says, it was important that Jesus said Lazarus. Because had he not said Lazarus, oh, <laughs> Jesus knows you by name. He knows your circumstances. He knows your situation. He knows what you're feeling. And so when Jesus engages with you, he engages with you by name. You're not just a person on an Excel spreadsheet somewhere in the kingdom of heaven. You're not just ranking up numbers so that he can show, like, hey, here's what we've done. No, he's like, these are my children. This is so-and-so, and this is what so-and-so is going through. And if so-and-so believes, then I can't wait to shout so-and-so's name. The dead man came out bound hand and foot with linen strips, with his face wrapped in cloth, a cloth. Jesus said to them, unwrap him and let him go. What can dead people do? Nothing. 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 There is nothing that you can do to earn you your salvation. Nothing. Nothing. And then I love the fact that, that the, the dead man, they're still calling him the dead man, came out. Oh right, John, John, John like it's, at this point you're like, hey, you, you realize he's not dead. He's probably just going, I, can't, I couldn't believe what just happened. The dead man, the, the dead, stop calling him dead. The dead man, okay. Like, I love the fact that even, like, he comes out and then Jesus goes, hey, those of you around him. Yeah. Community. I hope you see it. He, he doesn't say, no, take off those clothes. He says, no, those are round. H- help this man. We were beautifully designed for fellowship. And it is ridiculous. It is ridiculous to think that, you know what, I can do this on my own. I don't, I don't need anybody else around me. I'm okay. I can do this on my own. And God is going, but I've never, I never created you that way. that we were created out of an overflow of this beautiful community that existed between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so who are we to try to change that? We need one another. Unwrap him and let him go. I hope that Lazarus burnt those clothes. Because people who are alive don't wear dead clothes, or dead man's clothes, or dead person's clothes. But I think some of us, we don't. We don't get rid of those clothes. We, we'll go pack them somewhere. Those don't belong to you. They're dirty. They smell. They've got holes in them. They're not meant for people who are alive. And yet somehow we, we drag those things out. And the evil one will whisper in your ear and go, but, but actually this is who you are. And, and this is who you are, and, and this is the kind of thoughts that you have, and the kinds of desires that you have. Like, this is who you are. Like, you're not, you're not a child of God. Like, this, this pointing to the dead. 
the dead person's clothes, your old clothes, this is who you are. Why don't you just put them on? It's in that moment where we go, you know what? You're right. You're right. I did do those things and I did have those thoughts. But you know what? But God. Amen. But God. When he looks at me, he first sees his son. God sent Jesus to come and make that which was dead alive. Yeah, amen. Verse 5 tells us this. Made us alive with Christ even though we were dead in trespasses. Friends, Jesus doesn't, he doesn't come to make us good or better. Some of us, we, we live as if Jesus comes to give us an upgrade. Like, my life was really great, you know, it was really good. I just needed an upgrade. D dead people, you, you can't upgrade a dead person. They need to be made alive. Yeah. And that's how we need to see this, that, that Jesus shows up and makes me alive. Yeah. That, that without him, separated from him, I'll go ahead and tell you, I'm one of the worst, if not the worst person you'll come across. Oh, but only are you. Don't, don't put all that on you. Guys, I know me. I'm just being honest. I know me. I know how selfish I can be, how impatient I can be. I pick me. Me, myself, and I. The unholy trinity. That's who I pick. And so Jesus comes and he makes us alive. The reality is you, you can't make dead people anything but alive. That's all, that's all you can do. And only Jesus can do that. No one can crawl out of their death valley. No matter how tough you are, how smart you are, how much you have in the bank, you cannot pull yourself out of the death valley. We need to be pulled out. And God does this through Jesus' death and resurrection. And all of it, all of it is an act of grace. All of it is an act of grace. We do, we do nothing to earn it. Now, we can talk about sanctification, right? Like, what happens after I come to Jesus? Oh, that requires effort. Can I tell you, being a Christian is hard. I, I'm, I'm, I'll, be, I'll be the first one to say it. It's hard being a Christian. To love my enemy, it's hard. It's like, no, go the extra mile. What? For who? For who? Love your neighbor. Show hospitality. Forgive. Forgive. No, but you have no idea what they did to me, what they say about me, what they... Forgive. It's hard to be a Christian. Being a Christian requires effort. Becoming a Christian is simply looking to the heavens and going, God, I need a favor. Because I can't do this for myself. I can't save myself. I need you. Help. That's what it is. It requires you to let go of control, or at least the control that you think you have. To let go of that pride, because let's be honest, that's what it is. And then just to go, you know what? I need help. You know how hard it is for, for us here in the room just to look to the person next to you and go, I need help. I can't do for me. Can you come help me out? And I can't, I can't pay you back. I, I've got nothing to give you. You know how hard that is? That's pride. Why can't I say, why can't I say I need help? I'm not doing well, I need help. My marriage is not doing well, I need help. Emotionally, I'm not doing well, I need help feel depressed, I need help. This culture of pretending and performing is dangerous. It's dangerous. And it's in complete opposite to salvation, the complete opposition to, to how we are to understand salvation. Salvation is, it's a free gift, here we go. It's all an act of grace. And in case we missed it, Paul tells us, 
He tells us in Ephesians, in the second part of chapter 2, verse 5. He says, you are saved by grace. Just in case you missed it. Just, Just in case you thought, I pulled myself up by my own bootstraps. I got here on my own. I showed up to the Sunday gathering on my own. My life is good because I did it. You've been saved by grace. No amount of work can earn your salvation. It's grace and grace alone. But wait, there's more. You are not just pulled out of the death valley and made alive. But but you are, look, verse 6, raised up with him and seated with him in the heavens. Now, now I get it. You might go, but on a, I'm sitting here at New Hope School on a really hard plastic chair. <laughs> Either you guys need to buy some cushions or you need to preach quicker because this thing is not... I get it. Like you, you're right here today. You're here. But, but what, what the gospel does is it goes, no, 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 you're here for a season, yeah. but your home is in heaven with God the Father. Yeah. And you are seated with him. Where is Jesus seated? At the right hand of the Father. In all glory. That is is who you are. If you've crossed the line of faith, if you've given your life to Jesus, that is who you are. This This is why we plead. This is why I plead with people. To just let go. You don't have to be in control. Just let go and trust Jesus. Put your, put your life in his hands because what he has for you far outweighs anything that you can think of or do here. And I'm looking at people who are going to do some really incredible things if you're not already doing it. Incredible things. Some, some of y'all, your names will be remembered for 100, 200, maybe 300 years. I could be wrong. Some of you might come up with something that that thing is then named after you and then you're remembered until Jesus returns, like incredible things. Hear me, they pale in comparison to what Jesus offers you. And so why would anybody reject that? So that in the coming ages, he might display the immeasurable riches of his grace through his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Friends, the resurrection of Jesus it makes all of this possible. Yeah. Yeah. This is why we celebrate Easter, because we, we see this and we go, all of this has been made possible because of Jesus' death and resurrection. Yeah. Easter Sunday is a celebration of what Jesus has done. He conquered sin, death, and Satan. Amen. Amen. Jesus told people that his resurrection was necessary for our resurrection. He would tell people that over and over and over again. He's like, listen, like I have to die and then, and then I'm going to resurrect so that you, when you die, that's not the end for you. Yeah. I mean, look at his conversation with a man called Nicodemus. It's in this late night conversation that we find the well-known John 3.16, of which I know many of you know, Right? John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes will have. I always go, what's after that? But for another day. So let's read this conversation together. I'll land the plane on here. There was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. I love the fact that John never calls miracles miracles. He calls them signs. Because what do signs do? Signs point to something. Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How can you be born, how can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Jesus answered, truly I tell you, 
Unless someone is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh, and whatever is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases, and you hear it, and, and it's sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is for everyone born of the Spirit. How can these things be, Nicod- asked Nicodemus? Are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Jesus replied, truly I tell you, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness. Now, just real quick context. You can go read about it in Numbers 21. What had happened is, remember, Moses had led the Israelites out of Egypt. They were going to the promised land. But because of their unbelief and their ongoing grumbling and complaining, God goes, you know what? I'm I'm done with these folks. And he sends these poisonous serpents. And they begin to bite people. And people are dying. And they realize, oh, my goodness, it's because of our unbelief. And so they cry out to Moses, like, listen, would God... God forgive us like would he would he grant us mercy and, and then God goes okay fine and they make this bronze serpent and then they lift it up and they say anyone who looks to that bronze serpent will be healed real quick just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness so the man so the son of man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life Do you see the two musts in this conversation? M-U-S-T. There are two musts in this conversation. We're told to have eternal life, you must be born again. You must be born again. If you want to sit with Jesus, if you, if you want to experience life and life to the full, if you want this eternal life, you must be born again. We like to say you must repent and believe. You must turn from whatever it is that you are pursuing, hoping to find life and meaning in, and then turn to Jesus. Let go of that and turn to Jesus. If you want eternal life, you must be born again. But for that to occur, the second must must happen. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. You see, for for the must of eternal life for us to happen, the, the must of Jesus to be lifted up must occur. And friends, on this side of it all, we know that he was. I can imagine Nicodemus looking at Jesus on the cross and going, it's starting to add up. That I cannot do this on my own. The call is to be born again, to have eternal life, but I cannot do this on my own. That must first happen. And it did. But but he wasn't just lifted up on the cross. Yes, he was brought back down again because he died. And three days later, he was lifted up again. He was lifted up again. And that is what we fix our eyes on. His death and his resurrection. That is what we preach. That's what we teach. That's what we share. That's what we hold on to. His death and resurrection. If you want to be born again, if you want to experience abundant life, recognize that he was lifted up. And that one day he will return to make all things new again. My hope is that many of you would anchor yourself in that truth. That many of you would recognize that you are in desperate need of a savior. And on Easter Sunday like this, what we do is we just, we just look to that and we go, yes. For those who've crossed the line of faith, you go, yes, I still believe. I still trust. I still keep my eyes lifted up to him who has done it all. But if you're here and you know that you're not a Christian, you know that you haven't crossed the line of faith, 
maybe in many ways, you're still having that conversation with Jesus, much like Nicodemus, and you're trying to figure out how all of this must happen. And he says to you, you must be born again. Be careful. Don't take that into your own hands and go, well, this is how I'm going to do it. No, 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 no. It's already been done. He's already been lifted up. And all those who look to him, much like the bronze serpent, they will be healed. And not just a physical healing, but a spiritual one. The one we need the most. So I'm going to pray. I'm going to respond in song, but, but I'm going to pray for folks in here. We're in the book of Hebrews, and, and maybe you've drifted. Maybe, maybe you've, you've, you've normalized this. Maybe this has just become the common thing that you do, and, oh, Easter Sunday's here again, and so I've got to go, and I've got to, you know, put on my Sunday best, and I'm going to pray that the Holy Spirit draws you back to the Father, to that place where you would fix your eyes on the one who has been lifted up. We sang about him. Now will you believe in him? Because what he has for you is life and life to the full. We've been talking about more this year and he wants to do immeasurably more, abundantly more, exceedingly more, but you've got to keep your eyes fixed on him. The one who has been lifted up. And so the call is to come back. Will you come back? And I'm going to pray for those who are in the room. And let's be honest. Let's just be honest for a moment and go, you know what? I, I, I have not surrendered my life to Jesus. He is not the Lord of my life. He is not my Savior. I know what to say because I've grown up in church and I've, I've been to the meetings and I've been to the groups and I've been to an Easter Sunday and, and my hope is that I'm just going to hear just enough to get me through to that next time when I need to come back again. The opportunity is right now in this moment to surrender your life to him. To let go of control. You are not in control because you cannot save yourself. But he saves you. And all you have to do is to say, God, I need you. I need you. And so I'm going to pray for you. And if that's you, and, and, and you take that step of faith and say, God, I'm trusting you. We want to celebrate with you. I'm hoping that you would come after the gathering and you would just share that with someone. Share it with the person that invited you. But if you... If you just want to walk with someone, we're here to do that. Just like Lazarus, who came out of the tomb, needed people around him to take off those clothes and go, let's walk as free people. And so, Father, we thank you for all that you have done. You are good and you are gracious. On a Sunday like this, we're able to look back and to remember what you have done for us. But your death and resurrection counts for every single person that says yes to you and so now in this very moment God I'm praying for those who are in the death valley and are realizing that there's nothing that they can do on their own to get out of that that God you need to pull them out and so would you do that in this very moment Holy Spirit take a hold of hearts save many And then, God, I pray for those who have been walking with you for a while but just got tired. The weight of this world is just way too much. And so it's so much easier to just drift and to do our own thing. I pray for your tender hand, God, to bring them back to you. Would you use community? Would you use the prayers of others? Would you use us to let them know that they are not alone? Father God, I pray for every single person in here. As now we stand and we respond to what you have done, God, I pray that these words, they would mean so much to us because he is risen. We love you. We praise you. We ask all of this in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen.